Well, thanks everybody for attending today's meeting. My name is Mike Beeger. I'm the president of the One Area Quality Assurance Association. Um, just a few quick notes. Um, we will be having our monthly meeting the second Wednesday of May. Uh, we'll start putting information out for that probably the end of the week, beginning of next week. Um, so watch for that to come. And today we have um, Paul Gosafi uh, here to speak to us about testing our metal. And so, Paul, if you want to go ahead and take it away, go for it. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. And thank you for taking time out of your day. And like uh, we talked about, I do realize this is a bit earlier than normal. So again, thank you uh, for accommodating me for that. Um, so the, the name of this talk is Testing in Metal. And the way this one came about is when I first started doing talks, I'm like, Boy, I'd like to incorporate metal somehow. And then a, a major conference like, Hey, we want you to keynote. So I submitted the keynote and they're like, cool, this is the keynote. And then about a month later, they went, well, we've discovered you gave this keynote before. It's like, well, number one, I told you that. And I'm at number two, I told you I was going to give you a, a, a unique version of it. They said, no, no, no. What else you got? So I got this metal thing I've been batting around. They went, yeah, 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 we'll take that. And then I went, suckers. So now, now I, I give this one when I can. So this is, uh, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about because I get to geek out on two of my favorite things, which are automation and metal. So without much further ado, we'll get on in here. So who am I? Uh, my name is Paul Grzeffi, and I'm a principal automation architect at Cognizant Soft Vision. I spent my career focused on automation with a little bit of a uh, detour over into being director of QA for a while, but the whole automation thing was was so much of more of a draw for me that I, I went back to it. I am an industry advisor for two different organizations. One is STPCon, uh, which is sort of morphed into a track at the upcoming InflectorCon, and for the Advanced Research Center of Software Testing and Quality Assurance at the University of Texas at Dallas. And clearly, I do love me some heavy music. If you do want to get in touch with me outside of this particular forum, uh, here are some of the contact ways you can get me. And that last link down at the bottom is, uh, that's where I blog uh, some hopefully moderately cogent thoughts. But who else am I? So that's all my techie, geeky things. Uh, who else am I? I'm a guy that was lucky enough to discover rock and roll early. Uh, when, when I was little, I think I was about six, a couple of my cousins came to live with us and they brought with them their Beatles records and their Kiss records. And I just didn't get the Beatles records, but boy, I love those Kiss records. And that just kind of stuck with me the whole, the whole way through my life growing up. Uh, the, the friends I mostly hung out with, they were, they were rock and roll fans, they were heavy metal fans. Uh, when I moved to Dallas from Louisiana, I was fortunate enough to just stumble across this guy that had been in the business for a while and we would go to concerts and he got me backstage and I got to meet a bunch of the people that I've been listening to growing up you know you grow up and you say wow it'd just be cool to see these guys in concert because I grew up in this little tiny uh, oil town in Louisiana and well relatively tiny and and my parents were like we're going to a concert and going to New Orleans that's like the big city and it's evil over there um, so clearly a, rather on the conservative side and the protective side. So having these opportunities to actually uh, talk to these people like human beings is was cool. It's awesome. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about primarily testing and automation. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some parallels to some of the lyrics of some of the bands that I really enjoy listening to. And this is not to convert anybody to listen to heavy metal. It's all about, uh, although if you do, that's awesome. But it's all about really giving you a different mindset when we start looking at what we mean by automation, how it can help us do our jobs, and what it's good for, what it might not be good for, and some, some pitfalls to avoid as we go. So we'll do a quick disclaimer thing here. So I do not own the songs, the lyrics, the images, uh, the ideas of the songs. All of that belong to the respective artists, uh, especially since I know we're being recorded here. Um, big disclaimer, not mine. I am borrowing this for educational purposes. Uh, I am not being compensated for this. I do, however, own 
the stories, thoughts, and impressions of how this music has influenced me and, and how it, it makes me either think about testing and automation or automation and testing makes me think about this music. So let's jump right in and let's not even waste any time. We'll get right to the heavy stuff. So Bolt Thrower, uh, a now defunct British band from England. Uh, I don't like a whole lot of death metal, but man, I really love this band because they infuse a lot of harmony in, um, and, and more interesting drum fills and drum beats than the average sort of death metal band might. And there's a song off of this, uh, this record. Uh, the record's called For Victory, but the song's called Lest We Forget, and the, the lyrics are Lest We Forget, the thoughts always haunt in the mind, haunt the mind, but lest we forget, the bitterness remains. And what we forget a lot, or some of us may not even have realized, is that when we talk about automation, what we're really talking about is software development. And we need to treat the automation that we create just like the application software, give or take, you know, just in quotes, because there are things that the application software does need to go through that the automation may not. And there are some things that the automation needs to go through and produce that the application code does not or isn't as important for it to do. So when we think about automation and creating automation, we don't just sit down and automate. The same way the developers don't just sit down and say, I think I'm gonna write an if statement here. No, there's a plan. So they, there's a plan of what is it that we're going to build, right? So we build it and then we store the artifact, right? The code, we store it in some sort of source control environment. We don't just store it on our desktops or in some share out in the, the oblivion or the, the Ethereth network. Um, there's just a way of producing software uh, in a very disciplined approach that we need to follow from an automation standpoint as well. And most of these things really map directly toward what we need to do in most cases for our automation as well. Continuous integration environments, not just for execution, but also for building. And we should have standards and we should have tools that help us maintain our standards built into the, the, uh, the continuous integration and the continuous building that we have for our automation, the same way we have it for our, our application code. We should do code inspections or code reviews. We should look at it. We should provide appropriate documentation. And I am a heretic. You should document your code with comments. Uh, yes, self-documenting code should be de rigueur. It's what we should do all the time. However, self-documenting uh, self self-documenting code misses something. It misses the why. Sometimes we do things in our code that are not the most intuitive way because we need to. Well, why do we do it that way? We should document why we're making these decisions, where some of these values came from, so that our future selves or our future other people that come and look at this code, don't look at it and go, this person was clearly a fool. Let me rewrite this the more intuitive way. And then it doesn't work because there was a, a context specific aspect that was not documented through this self-documenting code. So don't be afraid of code comments. Be afraid of them getting out of sync. Oh no, they're gonna get out of sync to the code. What are you doing code reviews, right? We talked about code reviews. Part of your code review is to review everything in that file, including those comments. So you review the comments to make sure they are still pertinent. They are still sufficiently accurate to the code and sufficiently helpful. If they are not, you leave a comment or a review mark there and the author goes back and, and rehabilitates that. Also, we must account for maintenance. Again, a lot of times automation is something that people who are, especially leadership, that they're not familiar with what's entailed with automation for testing. It's like, okay, well, then the testers are just going to do that too as well, right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's, you don't just do it. And you don't just get it done. Automation's not done until your product is done. 
So if you're going to change your product, you're going to change your automation. Also, since automation is code, you're going to have to maintain it. There will be bugs. There will be tool upgrades. There will be operating system and database upgrades, many of which will affect your automation plan for this maintenance. Otherwise, you're going to be caught by surprise and your value proposition is going to go right out of the window. And expertise. So there, there are really three ways to get expertise for automation into your organization. One is to buy it. You can hire somebody to come in and be your automation expert. You can rent it, you know, get somebody like me or, or you know, from the company I work for to come in for a while, help you get ramped up, coach you on how to keep it going, and then we evac out. Or you can get it yourself. You can build it yourself. You can have your own people learn how to do automation by themselves or maybe with some external courses or something. But the latter has to be tolerable to your organization because the further you get away from having a permanent expert, the more churn there's going to be, the more change there's going to be. And businesses and organizations are not always tolerant of, oops, we made a mistake, we're going to have to choose a different tool, or we're going to have to refactor 4,000 lines of code because we didn't know this one thing. So some organizations are very tolerant of that. Kudos to them. Other organizations are not. And if they are not, uh, for better or for worse, right, sometimes they just can't be, then you should either rent or, or buy in some expertise there. But remember, Automation is software, so we need to treat it that way. So we went from the really hard stuff into the, well, it's not really metal. It's really more rock and roll, or maybe hard rock, right? So Rush, um, the, the sort of quintessential progressive rock band that sort of made it into the mainstream over, let's say, Yes and Marillion and some of those other bands. And this is the much maligned Presto record, and it really is one of my favorites. And from the song Presto, it's if I could wave my magic wand, I'd set everybody free. And I really would. I mean, when it comes to automation, I would absolutely just set everybody free. I'd wave the magic wand. Boom, it's automated. And all of the things that are automatable are magically automatable. And that leaves the testers, the experienced people that know how to question the software, interrogate the software from a domain-specific or context-specific aspect, could go in and do things automation is just not capable of. There is no magic wand. There is no silver bullet. Um, it, it, it doesn't exist. So what we have to do is we have to treat this as not magic. Because when we talk about magic and we talk about auto magic and we talk about just doing things, what we're talking about here are misplaced expectations. And when we have misplaced expectations, they will not be met or not all of them will be met. Then there's the question of why did we do this? And automation doesn't work here. Automation's too expensive, bup, 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 bup. which may be true, but they weren't necessarily true based on the data you got from your magical expectations. I'm not going to lie. For those of you that, that aren't familiar with automation, automation is hard work. I find it rewarding. Other people do not. <laughs> but it's hard work. And some of it's not sexy work either. It's setting up continuous integration environments and building you know, data models that have to get imported and exported and, and, and reloaded. Some of that stuff is just kind of direct work but you still have to do it if you want an appropriate, healthy, and valuable automation initiative. So when we go and we talk about what our expectations are and figure out what we can and can't do with automation, or really should and shouldn't do with automation, and what's a viable tool or set of tools and technologies for us to use for our automation, we need to keep in mind what I call the, the automation ecosystem. And the automation ecosystem is made up of three parts. It's your strategy, your goals, your audience, and your environment. So very quickly, your, your strategy and goals is what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Not from an automation standpoint. Yes, we're trying to accomplish an automation. All right, very proud of you. 
<laughs> but what, we're, what are we really trying to do, right? Because we should have some organization and corporate goals that we're aiming toward. Software development should be directly in support of that. Testing should be directly in support of the development and automation should be directly in support of testing to help testers be more effective or more efficient, or hopefully both, at their job. So the goals are what we're aiming toward. The audience is who consumes your automation. You have your direct audience, the people who are writing the automation, people that are triaging failures, um, even, even the development team, because they are directly consuming the results to figure out what's wrong. You've got your indirect audience and people who are looking at testing trends and maybe your legal team who's saying, oh, wait, is that, can, can we, can we accept this software license with Apache or, or GNU or, or MIT, whatever, right? And then you've got your environment. What are you testing? Where are you testing? How are you testing it? Those all factor into your environment. And all of those things roll together, help you get your expectations in line. Because there is no magic, sadly. At least there's no magic in automation. There's magic in life. Um, my kids are eight, so there's still a lot of magic in their life, and I'm going to keep it that way as long as I can. Uh, but for us in automation, there's just not. So now let's switch over back to the hard stuff. Uh, Satyricon, one of the extreme or black metal, so to speak, bands. Um, I really like their record, Diabolical Now. It's, uh, it's not their classic work that a lot of people really, really go toward. I really like this one. And there's a, a title song called Diabolical Now. And the, the lyrics that always have sort of gotten to me are the, you cannot kill what you cannot see. You can't find it. You can't take care of it. And this equates to me to logs. So when we deal with automation, we talk about automation being like software development. There's a key difference. And the key difference is, let's say you're, you're building an e-commerce site. What's the end result of an interaction with the e-commerce site? It's not that email with the order number. It's the product came to your door. When that product at your, is at your house, you're done. That's when you're really done. Automation is a little different. The end result to automation is information. Something worked the way we scripted it out to. Something did not. Something unexpected happened. Something crashed. All of those things are pieces of information that help us make decisions about the quality of the product. So logs are absolutely essential and absolutely key to us being able to do our jobs and for automation to be valuable. So logs must adhere to what I call the three ables. They must be available, applicable, and understandable. Now the first one available seems to be pretty obvious, right? Well. We ran some tests. We can go and look at the logs, right? Well, I had a, comp, a, a client one time that said their original automation initiative sort of faltered in part because not everybody had access to the logs. So we're going to solve that first. Right? We're, going to get, we're going to get everybody access to whatever it is they need to. And, and this was one of those things where it was, I was caught really off guard because I was, I was, I was sort of flummoxed by that. I, like, I just figured everybody could get access to the logs. So, so they must be available. You need to know where they are and you need to have access to them. They must be applicable. How many times have you looked at an application log or an automation test run log where there's just noise in there? It's like, we don't care about this and this and why is this junk in here? Everything in that file and that log and that report and that result needs to be actionable or indirectly actionable. So, hey, look, this is a failure. I got a three and I expected a four. That is actionable. You can go and work on that. Oh, wait, here's how I got to getting a three instead of a four. Those are indirectly actionable. Those are all valuable. 
Anything that's not valuable, delete it because it's just going to slow you down. It's going to make it harder for you to triage failures, to debug failures, and it's going to cost more to maintain because the dirty secret of automation is that it's not the expensive part to create the automation up front, to write the scripts and build the frameworks and all that. Yeah, there's a cost there and it's a big upfront cost, but over the lifespan of your automation initiative, your cost is in maintenance. So anything you can do to minimize your maintenance, including minimize your debugging time, both from product failures and from uh, failures while you're developing your automated scripts, that's valuable. That's a valuable effort that you put in to reduce that maintenance. So keeping the noise, the un or the non-valuable items out of your log files, extremely valuable. And they must be understandable. And when I say understandable, I mean, when you look at a log file, it shouldn't be looking, it shouldn't like, well, it shouldn't be look like you're looking at Sanskrit, right? You should be able to look at a good chunk of the log and understand what the flow of control was and why it failed. If you don't, then perhaps there's some opportunities for tuning your log files for, again, making sure they're applicable, but also using a vocabulary or a jargon that is domain specific for your team or for your set of products. Uh, there are different ways to go about that logging going much deeper than that here is uh, we just don't have the time to get into that level of specificity. But in my blog, I do have a, uh, a, logging, um, a logging post in there. I think it's called it's log or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'll talk a little more about uh, the details that you can, you can look at when you start talking about logging. So Diamond Head, um, normally when I do this live, I say, hey, who's heard of Metallica? And I see, you know, somewhere between a smattering and a whole bunch of hands that have uh, raised their hand and say, yes, I've heard of Metallica. Well, Metallica list, lists Diamond Head as one of their influences, um, a major influence, actually, because if you start listening to, especially some of the earlier Metallica, you'll listen to it and say, wow, they've got a lot of song structures that are similar to Diamond Head. And they've even covered several of Diamond Head's tunes. So this is actually a tune that Diamond Head did, or that Metallica did cover. And this is from their 1980 record or the Diamond Head's 1980 record, uh, Lightning to the Nations, it's called Helpless. And the, the, the quote that jumped out at me one day, and this was after I'd done the first version of this, uh, of this talk, and this jumped out at me while I was listening to it. And I said, no, no, I'm going to get rid of the other song I was using for this. I'm going to use this. And it says, this business ain't for laughs and businessmen don't like it so. And the focus here is business. Because when we talk about automation, automation is not a technological decision. Automation is not a process decision. We don't automate because we're doing Scrum, because we're doing Agile, or because we've got DevOps, or because DevSecOps, or because Framework ABC or Process 1, 2, 3. That's not why we automate. We automate because there is value. We are putting in, uh, we're putting in effort up front to recover that effort and that value further down the line. So it really is a business decision baked in opportunity cost, baked in our ecosystem, baked in value. Is it more valuable today to perform task A, B, and C? Or is it better to perform X, Y, Z and defer A, B, and C until later? They're all context dependent and they're all individually case by case, I mean, I don't want to call them ad hoc because that's not fair, but they're certainly case by case. And um, hang on, I got a chat here. I want to make sure y'all didn't lose my audio or something. Ah, okay, cool. Somebody posted the, the oh, thanks, Dusty. All right, so I, I digress. I apologize for the distraction. But um, so value is very much context dependent. And, and, and there's a story I like to tell about value. So it was a guy driving down the road and he was on vacation and he was just kind of seeing the sights through the country, taking the scenic route. He saw this sign that said talking dog for sale. 
And he stopped and he said, oh, this is probably going to be some sort of gimmick, you know, and one of those things where who's the best baseball player, roof, uh, what's on top of the house, roof. But he said, ah, I got the time to burn. Let me go see what the, what the gimmick is here. So he drives down this country road. He drives out in this long gravel driveway to this farmhouse. And he sees this farmer sort of dozing on the, on the, on the porch. And then this old hound dog next to him swatting flies with his tail. So the guy gets out of the car and says, hey, I hear you've got a talking dog for sale. And the farmer says, yep. And he said, well, can I see him? The farmer says, well, let's see him right here. And the guy says, well, this doesn't look like much. It's in the talking dog, right? What kind, of, what kind of stick are you trying to pull on me here? The farmer said, well, ask him anything you want. So the man says, okay, dog, how did you learn how to talk? So the dog opens his eyes, stands up and says, well, sir, when I was just a pup, I got recruited by the CIA and they taught me how to speak all these languages. And what they would do is they would put me in the, in the rooms of all these foreign diplomats so that I could listen to what they were saying and then help prevent any sort of, you know, international violence and wars and stuff. So I, I did a great job, but eventually I got a little older and I wasn't quite as cute anymore. So the, the, the foreign diplomats didn't really want me in the room anymore. So the, the CIA gave me a choice. I said, hey, you can come out and live, you know, with one of these farmers and chase bunnies and swap flies and eat, you know, stew every day. So I decided to come on out here and this is where I live my life now. The traveler was incredulous. He said, Oh, my Lord, this is really a talking dog. How much do you want for this dog? The farmer said, $10. Again, the man was incredulous and said, $10 for a talking dog? Why so cheap? The farmer said, oh, he's a liar. He ain't never done any of that stuff. This is where I would usually pause for laughter. But, but, but the, the, the core of it, number one, I, I like that joke because you throw out two swear words and, and you can tell it to people of any age. But it really does kind of get to the core of value. The traveler valued that talking dog and thought 10 bucks for it was really good. The farmer, well, he valued the truth. He did not value the lies that the talking dog told. So he was eager to get rid of the dog for 10 bucks and everybody was going to get a value at that point. So value is very much context dependent. So you can always refer to the talking dog at that point. So, how long? There we go. So, Diamond Head was part of what was a movement that was uh, sort of retroactively called the New Wave of British Heavy Metal. And another band from New Wave of British Heavy Metal was Raven. And Raven really is one of my favorite bands as well. Uh, one of the bands that I just sort of stumbled across on a mixtape that I bought from Walmart or TGNY or something way back in the before times. And just loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. I've got all the records now. I have been fortunate enough to spend time with the band. Super cool dudes. John, if you're out there, thanks, man. Uh, this particular lyric is from their All For One record, and the song is All For One. And it's here, the call, All For One, One For All, which sounds a little trite, uh, but totally works in the context of the song and totally works in the context of what we're talking about here from automation. Because from this third rave, this third album by Raven, it, it, it really speaks to the fact that automation is not a testing job. It's not a QA job, a QE job. Automation is a cross-team endeavor, and it's cross all the teams and cross the organization. Because obviously, whoever's typing the keys for the automation needs to know how to program, right? But the developers, even if they're not the ones creating the automation, they have to participate in the automation endeavor as well by adding automatability. So if you think of, of, of the, the notion of testability to be controllability and observability, automatability is the programmatic access to the testability. So that has to be built in. That's not something that happens by accident. And we need the developers to help us with that. We also need to involve the business because again, remember, 
businessmen don't like that way, right? So we need to make good business decisions about what we do and what we do not automate and when we automate those things. We also have to involve the security team. The security team is not going to let us stand up our own mail server on the corporate network to do mail testing. That's just not a good idea. So we work with them to figure out, okay, here is what our requirement is from the business, from the goals that we're all supposed to be aligned to. Remember the ecosystem? How, do you, how are you going to help us accomplish our goals? And we have to talk to release management. Hey, we want to run these, these set of tests every time we do a software deploy. Well, we can't always just go out there and type the keys ourselves. Sometimes we have to talk to other people to help us out with that or to at least permit us to do it. And what about ops? Hey, we want all these virtual machines to run all these, these tests and scripts in parallel. You know, we can't just spin that up on our own. And then I talked about legal earlier um, when it comes to licensing and, and obligations based on open source and any changes that we may or may not be making to the open source software that we get in. Um, Consulting and working with our legal team and building good relationships there are going to be key to helping us meet those business goals. So also from the new wave of British heavy metal, likely the most notable and the most recognizable new wave of British heavy metal band, Iron Maiden, um, all sort of coming up through the same clubs and at the same time as Raven and Diamond Head and um, Gaskin and all sorts of other bands out there. Iron Maiden has, has gained probably the largest audience um, internationally of all those other bands. The particular song we're talking about here is from their album called Somewhere in Time. And the song is called Wasted Years. It was the first single off that record. And the lyrics that, that again, that really appeal and show me things in music that really appeal to or really apply to automation are so understand. Don't waste your time always searching for those wasted years. So really, this has a lot to do with touring and time and aging and, and all these, these other sorts of uh, aspects of the lives of the people in the band. But really, for me, it's applying to something that we call the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the sunk cost fallacy, it's the cost incurred and not recoverable for what it is that you're doing. So a lot of times we get attached to the money, effort, or time that's already spent. Oh, we've already spent $400,000 on this automation initiative with this tool. We can't just throw it away and start it over. That's the sunk cost fallacy, right? The fact that you're, you're going to start throwing so-called so the good money after bad, right? You made a bad decision. You spent some money. It's not always easy to do this, and sometimes there are consequences to doing this, but Sometimes the right thing to do from a value standpoint is to abandon what you're doing and start over, either in a flash cut or in some sort of evolutionary way. Um, the, this, this, this attachment to the money that we've spent often causes us to abandon logic and, and good business sense. So instead, what we need to do is when we build, think big and build small and evolve, pivoting when it's time, because we go, we are going to learn as we go. And the goal would be to get the most value out of whatever it is we're building, so that when we have to pivot and refactor, possibly rewrite as we go, we've got sufficient value that we've built up so far and sufficient runway that we can milk some value out of the old thing while we're creating the new thing. So we really have to keep that in mind uh, because we will all run into this if we've got an automation initiative of any appreciable age that we've had to go from the beginning until the end. And I live with this a lot of times because a lot of times my team is brought in to rehabilitate something. And the right answer is you really need to just end of life this and start fresh. Sometimes we really can't. We can come in and help you evolve what you have, but sometimes the right answer for your business goals and financially and, and just from a value standpoint is to, is to just cut the cord and then go on to the next thing. 
So now we go to Ozzy. Ozzy is probably my favorite artist uh, of all the things I listen to, of all the bands I listen to. Um, you know, Crazy Train comes on and the boys go, Dad, it's your favorite song. I mean, they, they even they know that, that Ozzy is my thing. So this is the closing song from what was going to be his last record back in 1993. And what year is it now? Oh, yeah, way after 1993. Uh, the song's called A Road to Nowhere. And the lyrics that, that have really appealed to me and my rock and roll buddy as well, but for different reasons. Uh, the wreckage of my past keeps haunting me. It just won't leave me alone. And what happens a lot of times with automation is we think of automation as a yes, no, black, white, on, off kind of thing. It is automated or it is not automated. So we really, really try to go that last mile. We try to get every little bit of the test of the process of the thing automated. And if we don't get it all, we consider it a failure. And that's sort of a, a bad mindset because what happens is we have misplaced expectations or just as often we create what we call Rube Goldberg machines. For those of you not familiar with Rube Goldberg, uh, he was a, a newspaper cartoonist, among other things, in the before times and like the long time ago times. I don't even know what year it was at this point um, before I was born. So if that gives you a clue. But he had this, this talent for writing, for making these cartoons of these fabulously complicated machines to do very mundane and simple things. Like one of the ones I always refer to is the automatic napkin. And there was like this, this contraption with a parrot and a steam pot. And um, I think there might have been, I don't know, there might have been a ball. It, but basically all of these weird things like the game Mousetrap to do something very simple like wipe your mouth, but you've got this complicated machine to do it. So we really have to watch building these Rube Goldberg machines because what happens is over time, they become much more complicated and much more uh, effort intensive to maintain than the value that they're putting forth. It might be better not to go the last mile get to the 80 or 90%, bask in the value of the automation that you've gotten there and understand that either the technology we're using or the technology that exists at all isn't there for us to be able to go that last mile. And that it's okay to have humans involved in the testing at that point. Because often that last mile is the effort of least value. And when I say least value, not that it doesn't provide some value, but it's not in proportion to the effort that you have to put in to create it and or maintain it. So again, if you played the game Mousetrap, that's a Rube Goldberg machine. You really don't need all of the contraptions with the dude in the bathtub and the ball and the, all the other things there just to drop a net over a mouse, right? You could just drop a net over a mouse. But if you have to go through all of that things, Perhaps catching that particular mouse isn't the right thing to do, or perhaps you need to rethink what your contraption is to catch the mouse in the first place. Oh, another favorite band. So they put out a record last year, Halloween. It's a self-titled record. They got a bunch of the old people back in the band along with the new people in the band. It's, it's you know, contender for last year's metal record of the year. My kids, again, they're eight. They latched onto this record and they are just beating me with this record. Every time we're in the car, we're, in the car, we're listening to the record, listen to the record. Dad, Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. And I love me some Halloween, but I do need a break from the new record. So as a break from the new record, we will go to what many consider their best record, which is the Keeper of the Second Seven, blah, blah, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part Two record. And uh, the, the big single from that record if metal can have a big single, was I want out. And the lyrics here really appeal to me. Are the people tell me A and B, tell me how I have to see things that I have seen already clear. So what this echoes for me is all of the media, the social media, all the articles and blogs telling me about what the best tool is. You should be using this tool. 
this tool is better than that tool. The old tool sucks and you got to use this tool now. But there's a big piece missing there. What it's missing is the context because the best tool for you is going to be a different best tool for you because it's not about best. It's about, about, it's about most appropriate. What is most appropriate and what is most appropriate now? And how do we project that into the future and be ready to pivot when appropriate is no longer appropriate? Because again, it's going to happen. So you can go out. And I used to do this on LinkedIn and you can go to forums and stuff. What's the best tool for mobile testing? What's the best tool for browser testing? What's the best tool for... The answer is there's not one. There just isn't. It's all about context and what your team can tolerate, what your team can adopt, adapt, and provide value with. Again, we go back to that automation ecosystem about your strategy, about your audience, and about your environment. When you ask those questions, or when people ask those questions, what's the best tool for Android automation? Wow, that's a huge question. It sounds small. Well, it's Appium, right? Well, not necessarily. Appium is an awesome tool using it now for, well, not mobile. I'm using it for a, a, a thick Windows client uh, along with Web app, WinApp Driver. And it's doing a great job. Are there other tools out there that could do that job? Yes. Are they better? I don't know. But in the context I'm working with, it's providing value. And we don't have a whole lot of uh, incentive to change because it's providing sufficient value for what we're doing. The dirty secret for this is that only we know our own context. Only you know your context and only you know your context. Well, unless y'all work together. <laughs> but, but really, only we can answer those questions. Only we can build that uh, sort of the word model of our ecosystem to understand which tools are appropriate, which are not. And listening to the blogs and the posts and all that stuff, there's nothing wrong with that. Those are all great. That's all great information for you to take in and help you with your understanding of your ecosystem when it comes down to selecting a tool or a technology, but you can't just, or you really shouldn't just use this tool because your friend over in this other company does, or because talking head thought leader over here says that that's the one they use. It has to be the best tool for you, not the best tool for me. So why, uh, Halloween falls into a category broadly of what's called power metal. Um, basically think of Iron Maiden on speed. <laughs> That's kind of what, what power metal is. And this is another power metal band also from Germany called Blind Guardian. And this is my favorite Blind Guardian song of all time. It's called Imaginations from the Other Side from the record also called Imaginations from the Other Side. And the lyrics are Imaginations from the Other Side far out of nowhere, it got back to my mind. And the imagination part is what sticks with me here. Um, use your imagination. Automation is not take test case, shove through tool, get out test script. Um, automation is about providing assistance. It's about providing value. It's about helping testers do their job more effectively or more efficiently, or like I said earlier, hopefully both. Use your imagination, right? Go beyond this whole test case and test script thing because there is nothing wrong with that. Every client I've worked with, every company I've worked for, we've had test scripts based off test case, right? Automation based off of test cases. And in most cases, it's provided value. In some cases, a lot of value. So I'm not demonizing that or vilifying that. What I'm saying is that is an implementation of automation. It is not what automation is. So what we need to do is if we can expand our definition of automation to consider not just the testing per se, but the crank turning. What is it about your job that's just repetitive, sucks, or just is something a computer would be really good at so you could go do something else? Sure. 
test case 647 didn't get automated today. But wow, I just saved us four hours of time every week because I automated this, this really terrible task that we have to do. There's value there. And that really is under that umbrella of automation or what I call automation assist, right? The non-traditional automation. And you can choose your own vocabulary there as long as all the people that you are, uh, that you're, you're speaking to understand what you're talking about. Okay, we're running a little short on time. So I am going to jump right to the last one here. And um, Gamma Ray follows right from Halloween. So uh, 1990, no, 1988, 89, Kai Hansen, guitar player, main, one of the main songwriters for Halloween Leaves and creates his own band, Gamma Ray. Uh, this is from their debut record called Heading for Tomorrow, and the song is also called Heading for Tomorrow. The lyrics are, we're heading for tomorrow, but we don't know if we're near. Um, will we beg or steal or borrow? Will we ever lose the fear? So what's coming? What's coming down the line is always this talk about what's coming for automation, what's coming for testing, what's the future? Well, all the sexy stuff now is AI and ML, right? It's going to replace us. It's going to replace, it's going to replace the testers, it's going to replace the developers, it's going to replace the automators. Eh, okay, maybe. But I do believe that in, well, certainly my career time, probably my lifetime, and probably my kids' career time and possibly lifetime. AI, ML, all that stuff, it's not going to replace testers completely, maybe not even at all, but certainly not completely in the realm of software delivery, of software creation. Because if you think about it, where does software come from? All right, it comes from people. Cool. Who uses the software? Directly or indirectly, people use the software. This AI, ML stuff is not really going to be something that's going to replace us in toto anytime in our career times, simply because it's not going to be ready yet. There's a human aspect to usability, understandability, accessibility, all of these illity things that are just not quantifiable in computer terms today. One day, maybe. Uh, I'll be long gone by then, probably. What I am hoping for, though, and I see sort of the inklings of this from some of the AI vendors and some of the other tool vendors as well, is lowering that cost of maintenance, lowering, hey, something changed in our product. There's nothing wrong with the test scripts. The flow is still the same, but the hooks, the seams, the handles, uh, whatever it is that we use to get into the tool for automatability, those things have changed. How can we minimize the effort there? And I really want the industry to focus on that. I start seeing this going. I think this is where our next big boon is going to be. Um, but change is coming. So be ready for it, right? And, and it might be a bit scary. So that's the, the scary lyric there. Um, will we ever lose the fear? No, and we kind of shouldn't, right? Fear kind of keeps us on our toes, kind of keeps us honest keeps us to where we want to make sure that we are ready for that pivot. But for me, and hopefully for you, I expect it to be a lot of fun. I like learning the new stuff. I like pivoting through my career so I don't get bored. Um, I'm really anxious to see what comes out. So over for the TLDR, for those of you that dozed off halfway through or came in halfway through and you didn't see it all, the core message here, outside of the metal stuff, is be responsible. Make judicious decisions about what you automate, how you automate, base it off your ecosystem, base it off of value. So I'm not going to read all of these individual items through you, but this, these are the references for the bands and the artwork. And I do have a few minutes for questions if there are questions out there. Watch the chat to see if anybody puts anything in there. Awesome. Yeah, fire it up or type it in the chat, whatever. I'm good. I guess no one has any questions. 
So it was either that boring or that obvious. I'm good at <laughs> <here. laughs> I like it. Oh. Well, I guess with that, Paul, thank you very much for your time today. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you for... Oh, wait, 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 wait. We have a chat. Said that, oh, we have yeah, something. Oh, Great talk. All right. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Oh, um, and like I said, uh, and Dusty said that this has been recorded. It'll be posted to our um, YouTube channel. And um, keep a watch out for next month's meeting information, which, like I said, will come out sometime next week, probably. And... Have a good rest of your day. If you're somewhere nice, enjoy the weather because here it's not very nice today. <laughs> and, All right, sorry to hear that, but hey, again, thank you for having me. Hey, it, it, it was a bit heavy. It was, 75, it was 75 degrees yesterday. It rained last night and it was sleeting this morning. Eek. So, <laughs> well, I live in the South, man. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh oh, thanks again, Paul. It's nice to chat with you. Y'all take All care. Right, take care.